Joining me now are Mark Slaughter, whom you all know as the frontman of the band with his name, Slaughter. Prior to that, the Vinnie Vincent Invasion. He also has a couple of great solo albums. Mark, it's uh, great to get a chance to talk to you again. Absolutely. My pleasure. And also with us is Joshua Seth Egan, who's the uh, drummer for a band called Seven Angels. They have a song of the same name. Uh, there's a video for it. More information, sevenangelsofficial.com. They're on Facebook at Seven Angels Band Official. I have to make sure I get all that right. That's why you see me. I, I've got sort of the, the low rent version of a teleprompter, just a second laptop right next to me. Uh, Josh, you've been a studio musician for a while now. And uh, we were talking before we got started. You're literally in, uh, in the studio now, right upstairs from a studio. Uh, and uh, from the notes, it says that you've been involved in, on some Grammy nominating, Grammy winning projects. And I was just wondering what a couple of those were and what some of your biggest takeaways were from those specific experiences. Um, I had, well, obviously one of the ones I'm most proud of, I loved Mark's record, Halfway There. That was kind of, you know, I was really proud we got nominated for a Grammy on that one. Uh, I worked with Pink, did her record, um, Try This which had trouble and all of that. And that ended up being the, uh, uh, the first record that she won a Grammy on. So it was really cool. That was kind of one of a sweet spot. And uh, yeah, it's been good. I've got to work with a lot of really great artists over the years. And it's really cool because when you're growing up, you, you know, you fantasize about getting to play with all these people. And then you, know, you look over the drums and there you are, you're in the same room and you're playing with them. It's like, you know, like, Man, mind blowing. You know, I, I one time looking out, there's Billy Sheehan on bass. I'm like, oh, just shoot me now. <laughs> you know, I'm just looking at, I was just cracking up. So yeah, it, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. You know, and I real quick, the, uh, another really great thing is the other drummers I meet because I have a studio as well. So a lot of my friends come in and uh, they'll come up and track. So, I, you know, I have people coming in like Tristan Bowden or Vinny Cauyuta or Walfredo Race. All my buddies will come in. I'm going, oh, my God. You know, so um, it's, it's great. No complaints. Uh, and Mark, uh, obviously, Seven Angels gets on your radar because uh, you and Josh have known each other for a little while, let's just say, right? Yeah, Josh and I uh, grew up together. We went to uh, high school together. And uh, um, I was a guitar player at that time. So it's kind of funny because, you know, because since we've known each other a lifetime, he knows how I play. So he started doing George's project and, uh, and also this one. And he said, hey, man, do you feel like playing a little guitar? And I'm like, yeah, just send it with the tracks. I mean, especially right now, it's perfect. <laughs> so uh, uh, I uh, knocked out some guitar and, and uh and it turned out really good. I'm real, real pleased and proud of what uh, uh, the sum of it all. You know, it sounds great. Yeah. Before uh, we started recording, before Mark jumped in, Josh and I, we were talking about, you know, how you're, a, a, you know, you're an accomplished guitar player. You're a great guitar player. But obviously, of course, people think of you as a vocalist first and foremost. And he, of course, knows Absolutely. from before that. And I was kind of talking about how I know on his most recent record, uh, Satriani just had Glenn Hughes, but he just had him play bass. He's like, no, I don't want you to sing. Just go ahead and mm -hmm. play the bass. And it's like, you don't always think of, you know, somebody who has a voice like that, but how good they can be at something else. So that, and like you're saying, so the, at this point, it was just like, great, I'll just play some guitar in it. And uh, was it's uh, actually, it's very enjoyable to me because, you know, usually, you know, when you're, you know, when you're a vocalist, you're, you're waving the flag for everybody, you know, when you're a guitar player, it's like, you know, you just kind of plug in and go, you know, it's just a, it's a, it's an easy thing. It's like chewing gum for me. I've been doing it so long. Yeah. Look, it's, it, it's great to, to be Mick Jagger or Axl Rose, but then there's something cool about being the guy there with the cigarette and just, you know, just, yeah, just being guitar. able to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> hang in the back and, and smile at it all, at it all. That's exactly it. Uh, so uh, Josh, tell us about, the band seven angels you know who's in it with you how you guys all got to know each other and uh, it seems like this this sort of came together because you work so much in the studio right yeah actually it was um we had been doing projects together as a band forever uh bob reynolds and i go back 25 years or more uh jesse vasquez same thing and uh so we started the project and uh as we went, we, we had James Oda Baker, a, a great guitar player as well, an amazing writer. And, and 
we had started off a project just writing and it became sort of this pet project we had over the years, you know. And uh, we were getting closer to doing it, but it was hard because everybody's schedule got busy. You know, we're doing all these other projects. So we had a record pretty well done. And um, when coronavirus hit, it was just kind of sitting there. And it was one of those things I told Mike, like, man, I'm just really like this thing sitting here. And it's like, you know, a diamond in the rough. But, you know, Bob Reynolds is, is a monster singer, you know, and, and I'm just going, you know, we're listening to the tracks and it just sounds so good. And, and we're like, okay, got to do something with this. And I showed Mark and I said, hey, what do you think, you know? And uh, originally the band was called uh, American Dinosaur. You know, it's a joke. We're all, you know, yeah. we're all, we're all dinosaur rockers. Hey, you know, and uh, yeah. so it, it was like, it was like a tongue in cheek thing. And, and that was sort of a working title for years. Problem was, it was a few years into it. We had finally had time. We finished all this up. By the time we were ready to actually release something, there was a band called American Dinosaur. Oh, no. And they were kids. They were kids. And I'm, I'm cracking up. And, and the band's good. You know, it checked it out. They're they a good band. They had two records out and already toured. I'm going, okay, well, that sucks. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, Bob, we, we were looking for names, and, and Seven Angels came up because it was a self titled tune. And the connotation was really good about it because you know you have the seven archangels and it's you know it's there's a there's the good side and the bad side sure. you know and it had a very good connotation especially with everything going on we're like you know that's a good name so yeah and obviously it's uh sounds nothing like the song but uh when i saw that the song was called seven angels the band of seven angels of course immediately you think about how bad company has the song bad company and then you're just like right. well, yeah of course that just sort of says who they are so i mean this is this is the song that that i've heard because it's the song that's out there uh and I, I i wanted to ask you specifically about it and you you can tell me if it's just me but i listened to it a few times and i, I i'm like am, am i just hearing this but i got this like overture from jesus christ superstar vibe for uh some of the some of the early you know, the beginning of it and i i listened to it afterwards i'm like no i i feel it and maybe maybe it's just me but i also feel like thematically it ties in because the lyrics talk about you know how everything's all right and not saying that this is even a spiritual song but it just uh it, it just that's where it took my mind to now is this is am i is this just me basically well this the the first of all the intro and the outro in the middle section mark had come up with so okay. this, that was after the tune was written mark had come up with this whole sort of overture intro uh, but the, the tune itself Bob had, uh, we had had the tune and Bob went and, and went back and went over the lyrics and, and worked them out. And as he was writing it, it was coming from that place. There was a, a spiritual thing behind it where he was saying, because, you know, what you go through in your life and the struggles, you know, that you go through, you know, somebody, you know, throw me a prayer, you know, it's, yeah. you know, it, it is it, that it's more of like a street you know, sort of guttural thing of like, you know, you, you've been kicked and beat, you know. And, and, you know, the, the, you know, what I came up with on it is it, it is kind of that Egyptian dash, you know, uh, Bethlehem. It does have that, that uh, Middle East vibe to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I was doing in the, in the scale that I was using on it. But again, to me, it was almost like I felt that, the things I did guitar wise on this was more of a, of a, uh, um, a tip of the hat to two of my favorite guitar players, Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck. I mean, I sure. think there's a combination of, of, you know, two of my favorite guitar players. And I kind of heard that in my head the first time it went by on the track and it's a great track. And, you know, like Josh said, when, you know, as far as, uh, you know, Bob's vocals on it and everything they're just they're fantastic I'm like well what do you want to do with the vocals are fine he's like no dude I want you to play guitar on it you know <laughs> like, oh okay yeah and I don't get those calls often you know but um, <laughs> I had I had a I had a blast doing it and, it, and the end result is uh, you know there is a lot of um, there's there's just an underlying energy to this song and it was it was great to be a part of it 
Yeah, and uh, as I mentioned, there is a video for it, and the video has a very modern, as in very socially distant feel to it, because it seems like you know nobody's in the same place. But I think that lends itself to the way so much music is made, where you're not in the same place anyway. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, talk a little bit about making the video. I mean, it, it, it it's clearly a bunch of separate shots, and and you know. Uh, that that really it seems to speak to like yeah and uh, i think they're all outdoors you know so it definitely has sort of this wide open kind of feeling and there's you know some well, nice scenery was, in the beginning of it as well yeah the 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 tricky part of that was originally there was going to be a film crew you know uh, first we were coming up to the deadlines for the release dates for george's record and for seven angels and then covid got worse and worse and then the lockdown and you couldn't get any film crew to come out so we had to shoot that ourselves. So we went out guerrilla style and did it. And then Georgia had to literally learn how to do Adobe on the fly. And she learned it as she was doing it. And I was literally blown away, but she's incredibly artistic, you know, being from Rome, she's an artist and sure. a painter. And, um, so she just has that, you know, in her, in her wheelhouse, she can do that. I don't know how that she is, but she does. So we did it. And, but it was a little tricky because especially with Mark being in Tennessee, um, uh, Bob and Jesse and I all live in Santa Clarita. Oh, okay. So we're literally a stone's throw. Bob is five minutes from me and Jesse's seven minutes. So um, we were together actually. We were all there <laughs> for me. We were together, oh, but we funny. had to make it look like we weren't because we had, because Mark wasn't going to be there. So we had to make it feel like there's a separatism so we consciously did that thing, but there is a green screen. We're all there in front of green screens. So we shot on the green screens where we were, knew we were gonna do cutaways. And then we knew uh, Bob had the Harley, you know, so we went up into, uh, into um, sort of near Vasquez Rocks, you know, up off the 14. We went off into the canyon and we were shooting. So we picked spots where the guys would all be together, but we were all there for the shoot. So we picked our spots and we came and did the green screen shots. Um, and then Mark, uh, Mark had to do his shots. And we said, well, Mark, can we get your truck? <laughs> you know, Cause it was too cool. You can't, you cannot have that truck, not in the video, you know? Yeah. So basically I, I went outside my studio park, my truck cranked the tune out here at the farm and just shot a video. <laughs> But and, then, then we call him Mark, and then we call him back, Mark, that's really cool. Look, can you do some inside too? We're going to need some other cuts. So we were literally on the phone back and forth going, oh, can you go inside now and shoot? And let's get some close-up shots. And, you yeah. know, it was great. And video, and video files are very large. So, like, I would do the shot and then put it in my laptop and let it upload while I was filming something else. And that's how... <laughs> That's the time frame of how we were doing it because it was just, you know, we're down to the last minute, you know. And then I got to call Mark back going, dude, I have the cheap version of Dropbox. Can you take the one out of it? I can't get the new one. <laughs> the file limit was exceeding. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I've dealt with that too. Just it, just with audio files, sometimes it's like, yeah, uh, yeah I, uh, I, I, I have the free one. I need, uh, I need some help with that. So obviously, Mark, that's a, a lot different than, you know, where we are now, the ease with which you can make videos uh, yourself, uh, that's obviously such a far cry from, you know, 30 years ago doing, you know, Up All Night, Fly to the Angels, you know, sort of these oh, yeah. you know, huge I mean, budget here's productions. The, here's yeah. the truth, but, you know, the slaughter stuff, what a lot of people don't realize is in the slaughter stuff, um, you know, we were doing those records, you know, Dana and I were in the studio, just knocked them out and and you know we're very friendly to the studio like much like josh is so you know it's like one of those things we can all speak the same language it's real easy for me to 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 talk to josh about what he's looking for what the track is you know i played the guitar in seven angels of what the track needed not a showcase of hey look what i can do because that's ultimately that's the most important thing i think as a guitar player which you know, you think different as a singer than a guitar player. And then guitar player, you go, what's best for the song? Mark, you know? can you think of any guitar players who, when they play a solo, their whole intent is to show you what they can do, whether it fits the song or not? Does anybody come to mind? You don't have to name any names. No, I don't know anybody like that. <laughs> no, but you know what? Nobody in music knows anybody like that. There is no one like that. Yeah, there's nobody. Uh, yeah, that's an anomaly.
<laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. you you guys were talking about grow, growing up, you know, going to high school together. What were some of the bands that you guys kind of discovered at the same time? You know, like, oh my God, have you heard this? Have you heard that? You know, like, were you just excited to share with each other, like a new band that you found or uh, that sort of thing? Uh, I, I was Tony Orlando and Dawn, you know. <laughs> right. Because you got to hey, knock, knock three knock times. Tony. Knock yeah, three don't times. knock Tony. I love yeah. Tony. Tony Orlando is awesome. He's great people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, there was a lot of, you know, we played jazz in jazz band. We played, in, you know, in other stuff. So, you know, I listened to a lot of studio records and like Lee Rittenauer, Larry Carlton, and it was the same wheelhouse of what Josh was because he was listening to Steve Picaro, Steve Gadd, all these guys or Jeff Picaro, excuse me, and Steve Gadd, and all these guys that are just amazing players. And we were influenced by these incredible studio cats. So mm -hmm. to us, it was really one of those things that we would share the parts. Hey, listen to this. I know it's not really something you listen to normally, but you'll dig this. So mm -hmm. we were really in the far reaching of things. The, the, the rock that was going on, I think everybody was influenced by it, but as far as that background and that learning and, and the chops and that stuff, I think that's one of the things that we grew up sharing and trying to grow musically. Yeah. Cause you, you would have like, everybody would come to school and, dude, did you see Rush last night or, you know, or Van Halen or Journey or whoever, all the big bands would come in April wine, you know, you'd have the big bands that would come through town and uh, Iron Maiden, you know, so everybody be at school the next day with the shirts on or whoever saw the concerts and that. So that was always a kind of a thread through everything. But then you had on the side, like you said, you'd have, we would listen to written hour, you know, and going, Oh man, check this out. Or Larry Carlton and, or, you know, Chick Corea, you know, so we were kind of, we're kind of nerdy, you know, <laughs> music guys to be, to, to really yeah. call it for what it is. We're kind of nerdy music guys. And I, you know, and again, even in my whole persona, I I feel like I've always been just kind of the guy next door. I never really looked at myself as, as a rock star, so to speak. I'm just like, I just love to make music. I just love the art of going out and having a good time and being the, as a singer, the ambassador to the party to say, hey, man, everybody raise your glasses up. Party starts now, <laughs> you know, it's pretty cool. Well, I think it's also important, you know, obviously as a musician, but even somebody who just listens to music like I do, you know, being able to know like, yeah, look, this jazz music is great. And also, you know what? Tie Yellow Ribbon is a great song. So we don't oh, need yeah. to, we don't need to knock Tony. Tony oh, you know, what's funny. You know, it's funny. I know Tony and I see him. I never see him except at airports. So like <laughs> I'll run into, I'll run into Tony Orlando and I'm like, Hey Tony. He's like, Hey Mark, how are you? Like, great. You know, it's like an old Vegas thing. Yeah. That's the other thing that Josh understands is, you know, we grew up around Vegas. So that was like one of those things. And, you know, Tony said to me years ago, he goes, you know what, man? He goes, you might not see it now, but you're the next into the casinos and you guys are going to play casinos and do this stuff. I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, right, Tony. And lo and behold, he's exactly right because he's gone through the process as an entertainer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we are ultimately in all this as an entertainer that you take the music out to people. You try to, you know, we try to make music that, that we were passionate about as kids and still are as, as adults, that we really try to share that, that passion for music as a listener, as well as a player. So I think that's really what we're doing in this. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of things to that. Obviously, like playing a casino gig, well, not right now during coronavirus, but say, you know, last year, you know, doing a, a right. casino gig, it's not the same as it was, you know, 30 years ago. I mean, I, I've, no. I've seen Alice Cooper <laughs> in a casino, yeah. I've seen Kiss in a casino, you know, I mean, and some of these casinos have these huge showrooms, you know, and I mean, right. uh, and these are sort of the, you know, the Native American reservation ones that I'm thinking of, but obviously, right. I, I guess you had like, you know, the joint of the Hard Rock, these places, those places are huge. So like playing a casino is not what it used to be, you know? So I think no, that- Yeah, it's changed a lot, but at the same, at the core, it's ultimately the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Las Vegas is known as the entertainment capital of the world. That is the title of Las Vegas that, that you know, and that is what we grew up in. Josh's father, you know, played piano with uh, a lot of the greats, you know, a lot of great players. Well, my brother Chris had a good analogy a few years ago. We were talking about it. 
when you know like Kasami Pass, Sinatra, all of the the Rat Pack is gone. You know the old Vegas, and he said, you know, we, I came in town and I looked around, and it was right around Christmas or New Year's Eve. And it was Chicago, Celine Dion, Journey, and then all the bands. It was one band after another lined up. I think even Nugent was there. It was like everybody was in Vegas. It was probably 25 or 30 bands, a cheat trick, you name it, Aerosmith. Every band was there. And, and my brother goes, he goes, yeah, he goes, they're the new Rat Pack. He goes, because the icons passed, and this is the new generation of Vegas. You know, it's the celebrities now could go there and the bigger icons because we all grew up. It's like our parents love Sinatra or Sammy and so forth. Well, this is for us, this is our generation, you know, yeah. and, and you, again, Vegas, as much as I used to laugh about it, they have the money to put the sound systems in. They have the money to put these incredible elaborate stages in. Which is really in fact, cool. In fact, one the one the 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 stage that I actually graduated on. I think you graduated on that stage as well, uh, Josh. Is uh, the Latin Theater for Performing Arts was yeah. what it was. It's a plan of Hollywood now. The, the the venue itself stayed the same. It was yeah. made for concerts. So like all these incredibly rock, you know, great rock artists would come through like Josh said, one night was Rush, the next night was Van Halen. So we had these amazing uh, touring bands that would come through and the the theater, which held about 8,000 people, was just made for great sonic sound. Oh, I mean, it was just unbelievable. It really was. Yeah, I mean, First that's the theater that... I was the Doobies there. Yeah, what's that? Sorry, you, so you guys saw the Doobie Brothers there, you said? That was it. That was uh, when I was a kid. My brother took me to the Doobies when... Uh, nice. uh, Michael McDonald was in the band Skunk Baxter, Tom Johnston. And it was like, that was like my first big concert it was the Doobie Brothers over at, at, uh, at the Aladdin. And, his, and here's fun. And the other, the other thing is funny is Tom Johnston, his brother was our, was our dean at our high school. So, I mean, it's just like, it's all freaking, it's all intertwined. Yeah. It's like, really? no matter what, we were like, yeah. <laughs> Dude, no, whoa, 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 whoa. That was his brother? Think about it. When we did, we did a, a, we did a, I still have the 45. He How wrote the song. Happen? Yeah, you, you're just now realizing that? <laughs> no, I didn't know. I swear to God. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, he wrote this track and he said to Josh and myself, and I can't remember who was playing bass when we tracked the song. It was, it was, Char it was Charles. It was Charles Gray and it, and it was JD. The, yeah, it was, a, so it was the four of us. Yeah, yeah, I have that. I have that 45 around here someplace. But, and, and again, we, we were always, you're always around talent in Vegas. Like his father played piano with, with, uh, you know, with uh, everybody. And that's one of the things you didn't really think of it as a kid because you're just living. You know, you're like, Hey man, we're going to go down to Seven Eleven, get a Slurpee and then we're going to rock out. Okay. You know, it's like <laughs> totally different mindset, you know, but yeah, it was, it, yes. it was funny because you the old Vegas thing remember, in high school. Remember, I used to like I was working at the Stardust, so I, right. I would I'd have to be at class in the morning. But I was working at the Stardust, and Frank Rosenthal, Lefty Rosenthal, was my boss. You know, so I remember right. the movie Casino with yeah. De Niro, and she, that was my boss. Was, was you know, <laughs> I mean, De Niro was playing Rosenthal, so it was like all the mobsters would come in. So I would be playing to two, three in the morning. I'd have to go home, you know, after getting off the gig, get like three hours sleep, rush to school. You know, come back in. You go, dude. On Friday, played last yeah. night. It was like, you know, like <laughs> oh, I'm just so tired. Like, come on, man, let's rock. Drink a sparkling <laughs> apple juice. You'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's funny that you mentioned to circle back to the stage that is now the Planet Hollywood. I know that uh, the Scorpions had a uh, residency plan there, which I know they're going to do next year. But you're talking about it. And I'm like, oh, one Christmas, I took my wife to see Gwen Stefani there. And you know what I'll say about that Gwen Stefani? The sound was amazing. And, right. it, you know, it really is. And, you know, I mean, any of the places that I've been there, uh, they really have that. And you guys have the advantage when you grow up somewhere like Las Vegas. Now I grew up in kind of the rural suburbs, but outside of New York city. So if, mm -hmm. if a band was on tour, I would get the chance to see them. So there was always that opportunity. And, you know, sometimes they would even come closer to where I lived, like the County fair and stuff like that. I didn't have to go all the way into the city. And so it's interesting when you have that kind of exposure, 
Uh, a few years ago, I, I interviewed, a, it was like a Southern rock band, uh, the Kenneth Bryan band and the main singer. I, I kind of asked the question, I ask a lot of people like, well, you know, what were uh, the first concert and what was like a moment where you went and you're, and for him, because he grew up somewhere really rural, it was like, oh, it was the Guns N' Roses Live at the Ritz concert on MTV. It was like something you saw on TV because right, right. you didn't get out to see like, the, you know, those bands aren't things that you get to see. And I think that's why, you know, even to this day, tribute bands can be such a, such a great, mm -hmm. you know, a uh, business model because you just go play places where the actual band doesn't Here's, play. It, and it really comes down to this ultimately to circle back around. It comes down to songs. It comes back to songs that emotionally move the listener in a way that that uh, it, it becomes your soundtrack or reminds you of something, you know? Um, and, you know, that's that's a key point with it. It's just like, you know, it takes you to that great place. That's what music does. It heals, and it heals all. I, I love that. I just love making music. Yeah, no, absolutely. And obviously you grow up sort of like the way you're talking with it in the background, how it's always there. It is just like the Slurpee at 7-Eleven. Uh, I'll ask you first, Josh, what's the moment where you're like, Oh, I, I really, I, I don't want to just do this for fun. You're like, this is, this is the thing I want to, you know, was it, was it even like a, a drummer you saw or was it just like a show where you're like, this is, this was so great. This is how I feel that I, I need to spend my time now. Um, in all honesty, um, there really never was a moment. It was weird because my dad played and it was always in the family. So like when I was a little kid, I would see Basie's band over or I would see dad playing piano with Sarah Vaughn and the thing. And, you know, so it was always, I knew that's what I was going to do from when I was a kid because it was just there in the house. It was like, wow, this is cool. You know, and I would see the music I always, you know, but I thought of myself, I was going to be a piano player or, you know, and I sucked at piano Then I tried guitar and then my brother tried to teach me and I sucked worse at guitar. And my dad was like, why don't you go play drums? He goes, it'll help your piano playing. So he took me to the drum shop in Vegas. It was the day Elvis died. I had my first drum lesson, wow. came home, found out Elvis died. And then, uh, and that was it. It was, but it was the first time I felt like that was the instrument that really spoke to me was being a drummer. And Mark, you were, obviously we established that you were playing guitar. When do you first think like, oh, you know what, I'll take a, uh, I'll give it a shot for singing. Did just other guys know that you could sing or how, how does it come about that you actually start singing? I, I sang my whole, you know, I always sang. I was always singing, you know, in, from the swing set you know, as a kid forward. Um, and I always listened to records. You know, for me being good, I would get a 45 record at the end of the day, at the end of the week for doing my chores, et cetera. So I would, you know, that was like what I look forward to every Friday is to go and get that 45 or an album. Um, I just love music. And again, you know, I knew I had the passion for it, but it wasn't like, this is what I'm going to do. Um, and then around fifth grade, they were having an audition for choir. And I thought, well, I can sing. I know I can sing, but, you know, I didn't know how good or bad I was. So I joined this choir in fifth grade. And the two gals that were running it played uh, acoustic guitars. So I watched what they're doing in their fingers and I was like, I can do that. So then I had like this toy guitar that my sister bought me that the string action was like an inch off the, the strings. <laughs> I had him tune it. And then a month later, I'm like jamming on an F chord and playing these C chords with, you know, strings that you shouldn't be able to play. And they said, you know, he could probably play. He's got strong hands. So my dad got me a cheapy harmony guitar and that's when I started get focusing more on guitar and singing and then it became guitar and then I ended up dropping it. I taught guitar and then I became a singer baptism by fire with Vinnie Vincent, which was totally crazy because then there's no security blanket. I'm just standing there with the microphone opening for Alice Cooper or Iron Maiden going, man, that, this is cool. I love Maiden. I love Alice Cooper. This is awesome. You know? Yeah, and I mean, in that in that case, you the, you know, you hadn't done that record, right? You toured for the the record that right. Robert Fleischman I sang, did, yeah, I, yeah. And I sounded, I sounded, uh, I had the same tonal quality as as Robert, so it wasn't something everybody was kind of like, oh, that doesn't sound like the guy. They they put me in the video. Um, I, I guess Robert wasn't going to tour with him anyway. So, uh, and, and he's a great guy. I've I've gotten to know him in the last. Uh, a uh, couple of years at the KISS conventions and 
you know, I never would have known him without that, you know, but uh, great singer, great guy, great talent. He wrote Wheel in the Sky for Journey. He was in Journey initially, Robert Fleischman right. was, and then, and then uh, Steve Perry came in. So great singer. Which, which it's funny to think about the fact that like, you know, down the list of like, here's what I can tell you about Robert Fleischman. Oh yeah. And he also wrote Wheel in the Sky, you know, I mean, it's just, right, it's, right. It's, it's like the little, yeah, no, he's, yeah, yeah. And he's, and he's really talented. He's very artistic. And, uh, you know, and I think that's the key point is, you know, this, this is not a talent contest. It's really, it's about entertainment. It's about, you know, making people's lives just like the same thing. I, you know, for me in music, it's like, I remember, you know, going to those concerts and seeing Van Halen or Rush and just going, oh my God, I totally want to do that. That's so cool. And you could see how the the energy in the whole crowd is being a listener and a fan in the, in the audience. You just go, wow, this is so cool. I want to be up there and have, I want to make these people feel like I'm feeling. I think that's what you fall in love with. Yeah. Okay. And that I think some of us fall in love with it and we realize pretty quickly, oh, well, we don't have, uh, you know, any kind of alacrity for any of those things. So we'll do something else where we get to interview people who can do it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, mostly, mostly writing. And, uh, you know, my, my day job for a long time, I've worked for the comedian Dennis Miller. And uh, so uh -huh. I've like warmed up crowds for him. I don't do stand up or anything, but it's like, I've, like for his, his comedy special. So I'll go out and tell uh -huh. people like, you know, if you go to TV taping, it's like, I make sure you applaud and laugh really hard. You know, all right. that stuff. You see the sign light up, you know, yeah. what everybody you do, let's you do all that stuff. Time. But it's yeah, still exactly. like I step I step out and I'm like, yeah, but there's like five thousand people here and it's like you know, right. and, and and they're all looking at me. And then I, you know, I'm not a comedian, but I made it and it, you make a joke and it doesn't go over, you're like, Okay, yeah, this is for the yeah. professionals, you know. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's better for me to just uh, sorry, what were you gonna say, Josh? Well, no, no, it, it's like Mark was saying, he goes, When you you know, when you look up on stage, you go, Yeah, that's what I wanna do. Like, you know, everybody has that that wide-eyed moment but then the reality sets in when you go yeah i want to be eddie van halen and then all of a sudden you got to carry the amps in the back of your car <laughs> you know you're carrying Man, it exactly back. i was like the token dude who set up everything in, yeah. in bands when i was a kid i was a guy with the truck so i would be moving all the equipment setting up the pa wiring the whole system up while everybody else is taking a shower and beautifying and i'm like running to the sink <laughs> to wash my underarms out to, to go do a show. But I mean, there are those people who really just are perfectionists and want it to be right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what I was, how I was even the way I was wired when I was a kid is I wanted it right. I wanted it to sound good. And, and I wanted people to have a good experience. And, and in reality, that's the moment you realize that you love it is when it's yeah. you're on the worst side of it and you still going, yeah, I want to do this, you know? Yeah. And I think that's what really it separated. It wasn't the worst side, even though, you know, that wasn't even the worst side. The fact was, is we were able to play. And that ultimately, yeah. everything that you do is for that hour or two hours that you just look forward to, to go, oh, yeah, that's why I took three planes and, you know, drove 250 miles to get here. You know, you, you know that those things are the things that, that you will do for your career. And it's not just money. It's because you love it. Yeah, you know, and it, it kind of reminds me that uh, one of the best things about the Van Halen story is that, you know, David Lee Roth, was, they thought he was a was a decent enough singer, uh, but it was the fact that he had the equipment. So they were like, all right, well, I yeah, guess he's PA our system. singer now. Yeah, it's, he's got the yeah. PA, so he's our singer yeah, now. Yeah, because of Dr. Roth, his dad <laughs> bought him the PA. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which I, I just love because, you know, with a different singer, they probably, you know, look, Eddie would have always been Eddie, but uh, you don't put that band together in the right way. You know, maybe we, we never hear them well, outside of backyard parties in Pasadena, you know? Well, David Lee Roth, no matter what anybody says, is the epitome of a, of a front man. That guy can move a crowd and do what it is. And, you know, he's a great front man. And Sammy was a great singer in, for Van Halen. So, I mean, yeah. You know, not that he wasn't a good front man. It's just, you know, he's David Lee Roth was like doing the splits and doing all that. It was all his moves that made it like, man, look at this guy. He was a front man. It was a show. And, and you know, I, so I mean, that's, that's still Dave at the beginning of March, right? Right. Like a week before everything started to shut down. I saw David Lee Roth at Staples Center open for Kiss. And uh, I was just like, you know, I, I probably hadn't seen him 
I don't know, I'd seen him solo probably like, I don't know, early 90s, 92, maybe somewhere in that range. And I was just like, yeah, Dave's, Dave's still Dave, you know, and he's uh, yeah. very entertaining and it's great to see him. And, uh, you know, he's definitely one of those as, as at least just a music fan, you know, people who work with him might say something different, but uh, just, to, just to watch that guy, it's great. And, you know, sort of the thing you're talking about, about, you know, traveling because it's your job, just somebody as growing up a music fan, I, I talked about, I was a little bit outside of New York City, so I had to make a special trip if I was gonna see anybody. It wasn't just down the street. So, right. and then the first concert I ever go to in 1990 is Alice Cooper. And I'm like, well, I can't do any of that, but this is great. Like, I definitely know. and. The second concert I go to is at the local county fairgrounds. This is in 1990. Uh, Kiss is the headliner. And so the second band I ever see is Slaughter. And oh, I, wow. I, I, like, I went and bought that cassette the next day because I was just like, I want to hear all these songs, you know? So it was uh, like, that's great. Yeah. And it's great that, you know, you're still at it. I, you know, I talked to you about three years ago when Halfway There came out. Right. And I remember from that interview, the same thing that right now, that the whole time you were kind of playing on your guitar. So I'm kind of wondering, are you working on anything specific right now? Anything that uh, you have plans for or just kind of messing around in the studio? Um, as I sit down here, I mean, it's also a thing for me. I can actually, you know, do scales and do exercises while I, while I'm just sitting here. It's just one of those things of probably the ADD in me is like either, either my fingers are going to go or my butt will grow legs. It's like that <laughs> type of things that happens and I'll walk out. So I just have to be moving. As far as writing, I'm always writing. I'm always playing. I'm always hearing songs. I wake up in the middle of the night hearing songs in my head. So, you know, I, I just really just try to put it all down and then have a, a reference point to go, I have a song for that. And then I, I can do something with it. Uh, and, you know, uh, your, your website, just markslaughter.com, I did uh, take a look and I see that there are some shows listed for later in the year. And usually, if, if we'd done this interview like two months ago, I would have just assumed that there's no way they're all happening. But I talked to Randy Rand from the band Autograph, and I was kind of asking him the same question I'd ask anybody. It's like, oh, so you're trying to get back on the road. He's like, no, we played a gig last week. He had played a gig yeah. in Colorado for like 7,000 people. So right. there are places, you know, where things are happening. Uh, so our, as of right now, we're talking on August 21st. Are these gigs that, as far as you know, are still going to happen? I mean, they, they, it seems to be yeah. a regional thing. Like I see you have a gig in Texas. Texas seems to be a place where shows might actually be happening. So I was just kind of wondering. There's probably about four or five shows that, that are not canceled that are still out there. And, and again, it's not for me to say, it's yeah, like sure. we have to wait for the government, we have to wait for the promoter. You know, we're already contracted for those dates. So we're just in a holding pattern. You know, it's kind of like joining the army in this thing. It's like, okay, boys, it's time to jump. And everybody jumps <laughs> on the plane, you know? Yeah. It's, it's the same type of thing with, with that is, I don't know what's gonna happen, but we're ready. We have about, uh, you know, like, like I said, about five shows. We were asked to do surges and we were asked to do another show and I just didn't feel it was the right time. Sure. So, you know, we held off on that. Not saying that, you know, there's other bands that are doing that, but um, I, it, I think that we're all just trying to, I, how would I put it? I don't want to be the, the bug zapper and, and the light that brings all the moss to the, the bug zapper, so to speak. I sure. don't want to be that. And that's kind of how I look at it. I, I really want everybody to be safe. It's not a money grab for me. It's about everybody enjoying a concert, not walking away sick. So uh, that's and, where I'm at. And Josh, obviously, uh, Seven Angels at the moment, uh, there's, there's nothing planned. But you mentioned that you guys all live in Santa Clarita. So, I mean, are you just waiting for the Canyon Club to open so that you guys can walk down the street and do a gig there? Or, uh, or when's the plan to uh, try and do some live shows? Well, we actually had planned on it. That was what we were hoping to do, but we're going to actually be streaming from the studio. We're getting all set up to do live concerts and stream out of the studio here. So um, it's been a little bit of an investment in camera gear and so forth, because I don't really see a lot of the venues. A lot of my friends are doing the venues here, but then they're closing again. They open, they close, they open, they close. Um, yeah, it would be it would be awesome. It, it, we've had people been asking us to do uh, uh, to go out with Seven Angels. We even in New York, we had some people asking us to go back and do a couple music festivals that are coming up out there uh, with Seven Angels, and then with Georgia, do a double bill. So um, 
Yeah, it would be great. But it, it's just a hard thing to know when the time is right and when it would be a safe thing to do because, you know, um, I, I just, on, I mean, my end, like Georgia, my wife, Georgia, her, sure. her sister is a thoracic surgeon in Rome. And her mom was at the pharmacy. So they've been ground zero in Italy for the, yeah. this whole thing. And it's really serious. You know, and I think they've kind of, we've politicized it and made it different things over here. But the truth is, it's, it's still around and it's coming back. And, it, and we haven't even kicked the first round of it. And we're going to have a second. Yeah, we're still in phase one right now. I mean, that's a crazy thing. We haven't even ended the first part of this pandemic. So it's like, you know, it's... It's hard and I keep running into people. There's people I know that have it. There's, you know, it's just, it's nonstop. And it's, for some, it's a little easier than others, but you know, there's also, you know, some people that have died, you know, due to it. So. A few musician know, we, friends have that, yeah. I, that were deathly sick on, on life support for three weeks and, you know, their kidneys are ruined, heart failure, you know. Yeah. So it, it, it really is serious, you know, and that's a scary thing is, you know, and at least in our age demographic too, we're not kids anymore, nor are people of fans in that, you know, everybody's middle age and, you know, it's, it's something to think about, or if you are healthy, God forbid, but you're carrying it and you bring it home to somebody, you know, so that's a, it's a scary time right now. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I think that's the way a lot of people look at it. And Mark, I think you uh, kind of really summarized it perfectly. You don't want to be the bug zapper that people are attracted no, to because I, it's one I thing don't. of like, you know, I need to go to the supermarket. Sometimes you you know you got to get something at Home Depot or Target, sure, or whatever. Sure. But <clears throat> you don't have to go to the movie theater, which here in Southern California they're not even open, so that's beside the point. But I, I read that they opened in a lot of the country yesterday, and it's like, well, do you really have to go inside of a restaurant? Why don't you just bring it home? Or, you know, and then uh, all over Southern California, we see the the tents in the parking lot, at, like the Denny's parking lot, and people are eating in the parking lot under a tent. And I'm like, is that fun? Do you want to just bring that home, right. maybe? Like, what are you doing it for? So, yeah, well, the idea of indoor concerts in particular, especially just imagining a, a, a small venue like the Whiskey, you know, people are just, you know, crammed in there. Yeah, and when it's crammed in, I think, and, you know, again, which we're really not getting into it, but the truth of the matter is, is in this whole virus it's like legionnaires disease it gets in the hvac system it gets yeah. in those smaller clubs nursing homes in those areas where the air is not cleaned it's not cleared out it's not sanitized and that's where it spreads the worst is in those instances that nobody's really saying anything about that but live shows that are outdoor less apt to have any issues get yeah. into clothes can you know you know even on a plane you know, you're breathing the same air. And those are the places where it's dangerous. Yeah, the, uh, you know, I referenced the show that uh, Autograph did. That was an outdoor show, which makes sense. You know, I mean, I think that people are more inclined to do it. And I've seen pictures, I think it's in the UK, they're, they had a music festival, but it was like all these little rectangles and you had to stay like in your rectangle. So it was like assigned seating, but there were no seats. So it was like, you have to be this far apart. You don't go outside of that square. And I, I mean, I think that, that's where we're headed and and i don't know i think anybody who doesn't want to perform anybody who doesn't want to go to a show you get it uh it's just i think that a lot of us you know maybe didn't realize that the the last show we went to was going to be the last show that we saw you right, know right 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 you know i mean i referenced seeing david lee roth and kiss at the staples center and that's twenty thousand people and that was you know so like literally a week afterwards you know everything like my kids schools shut down everything started shutting down i'm like uh oh, I was in a really big place with a lot of people. So I was a little nervous for a while there, you know? So right, right. I would hate that feeling. I mean, you, God forbid somebody gets sick, but also just, okay, I don't feel sick, but am I going to? So yeah, I think right. the idea of waiting and, and, you know, Josh, to your point about doing the live streaming shows, uh, I've, I've, I've watched a few of those and there've been, a, there've been some great ones. You know, the monsters of rock cruise has like a channel, uh, that right, they, right. they've done a lot of stuff. Blanco just did that. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. I talked to uh, Frank Hannon and Tesla a couple of weeks ago. He, he did something there and they seem to have LA guns did that. So it seems like there's something like every week and it's great. And then, you know, you're starting to see individual bands that are just like, do you want to watch this stream? It's it's like a live stream. This isn't like a concert right. from two years ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, just uh, PayPal ten bucks and you get to you get like a virtual ticket to it. 
I think, uh, I, and I think that could be more fun too, especially if it's like interactive in some way, you know, instead of, That's what you know, we're instead, working of on. instead of yeah. shouting out free bird, you can just type in the message box, free bird, free question free. mark. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, uh, it's been great talking to both of you guys uh, and uh, very excited to hear more from seven angels, uh, seven angels band official uh, is the Facebook and uh, well, I see, I got it mixed up now. I had it right before. But then I looked at it the wrong way. So it's Seven Angels Band Official is the Facebook, sevenangelsofficial.com. So I guess it is really the same. So, uh, and that's where we can find anything. So, uh, Josh, any ideas on uh, when we might hear more songs from the band or is it all pending? More songs, more songs from the band. I think he, there's more songs that they've already recorded. That we've been doing and Georgia's record released for her. And um, so Georgia's record will be releasing another single in a few weeks. Uh, and Mark has already played several. Uh, so they're ready to go. And Seven Angels, we're working on them now. So like Jody has us releasing every eight to 10 weeks. Okay. Yeah. No, I think that's a, that, that's a great way to do it. And it's a, you know, I, I, I love getting all these, uh, Hey, do you want to talk uh, here? Here's a new song that you, that I would not have heard if uh, Jody didn't send it to me. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's always great to get these conversations and, you know, are you still working with Dennis Miller? Are you still yeah, working with him? I do a podcast He's great. with him. Yeah. He is I great. I co-host He's a great. podcast with him and you know, he, uh, he's a Pittsburgh he, boy. Yeah, he is a Pittsburgh boy. He can talk to, uh -huh. he can literally talk to anybody. We did a half an hour yeah. with Oliver Stone. Uh, it was super intense, but he's fascinating. And then, you yes, know, he is. did a half an hour with, uh, with Nugent, uh, Alice Cooper, you know, I mean, we, we get a, a good mix of uh, music and even, you know, even somebody that he's not as familiar with. He talked to Klaus from the Scorpions and honestly, he knew like two Scorpion songs, but it's like, it doesn't right. matter because, you know, he's such a good conversationalist, you know? Yeah, and yeah, he is. So, he's very, very humorous and, and, uh, and uh, insightful. That's for yeah. sure. Well, thank you both so much. Uh, I, I appreciate it. And uh, Mark, I know you're on Twitter at Mark Slaughter 33. Uh, and, and Josh, it's all seven angels official. If, if uh, we want to keep in touch with it. And uh Josh, I, I feel like you know, this was the part of the conversation before we started recording. I, I feel like I know a, uh, a certain Mexican restaurant that I'm very likely to run into you in the pickup line. Uh, I, Mark and I have been working on sponsorships, right? We're going like, hey, man, that's, you know, the whole world comes down to sponsorships. So I'm not really saying much, but I'm just going <laughs> to, man, this is really good. Right? Yeah. Mm. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, I talked about uh, Slaughter Touring with Kiss. If there's anybody who knows how to, uh, you know, synergize the branding, it would be uh, Gene and Paul. Uh, I, That's I, I right. Literally, I literally got a Facebook pop up ad letting me know that their restaurant in Buena Park, which isn't that close to here, it's where Knott's Berry Farm is, letting me know that it's reopened just because I like to kiss page. Just so. so you know, you can go out and get some, look at some Kiss memorabilia. And you can you could take a picture with our records and our boots. <laughs> and that's really the reason I brought it up because I wanted to try and get Mark to do the impression. Anyway, thank you guys so much. Looking forward to uh, talking again in the future and uh, getting new music from both of you, Seven Angels and Mark, whatever's next for you. Thanks so much, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you.